I'm very excited today to introduce to you my theory of induction, a systematic, rigorous method of proving generalizations from observation. In this short summary, I'll indicate the essential features and benefits of my theory in order to motivate you to read the book. Let's understand the epistemological trump card, which makes our approach to physics special, here on Inductica. In this presentation, I'll be reading a paper which summarizes my theory of induction, which can be found on the website. For additional comprehension, you can watch the video and uh, read along with me as I talk. If you're interested in buying a copy of the book, you can support Inductica at patreon.com slash Inductica. Overview. Like other objectivist philosophers, I conceptualize a generalization as a proposition of the form all S is P. For example, all metals conduct electricity. Since most important scientific conclusions are generalizations, a method for proving generalizations is critical for achieving certainty in the sciences. My theory can be used to prove new discoveries and to formulate an inductive proof of past discoveries. Proof of past discoveries will give scientists the certainty and clarity in many established scientific conclusions and will uncover flaws in foundational beliefs accepted in the past. The immediate application and testing ground for my theory is to overhaul the, the flawed foundations of modern physics and use the clarified context of knowledge to break the stagnation in that field. Proof through inductive narrative. Inductive proof must proceed in a proper order. One must reason only with direct observation and ideas that have been proven by a long chain leading back to direct observation. My theory of induction proves conclusions in the form of a story following a possible process of discovery, the observations and reasoning steps forming a plot where each discovery is made possible by the discoveries made earlier. Inductive proof requires that one reason with one's full context of knowledge. More on this in a moment. Stories aid the mind in keeping track of this total in the form of a plot. Further, stories provide a natural framework for maintaining logical order. Characters in the narrative cannot come to a conclusion until they have made the required observations and reasoning steps. They cannot test a hypothesis until they have observed evidence for that hypothesis. As a result of this, violations of logical order are experienced by the reader as plot holes. And as long as you haven't watched too many Marvel movies, plot holes are very intuitive to catch. Proper conceptualization justifies generalizations. So what proves a generalization? The view of many objectivists, including Leonard Peikoff, is that a generalization is proven by grasping a causal connection. For example, balls are round, roundness requires that an object roll when it's pushed, therefore balls roll. This kind of reasoning does not prove a generalization though, it simply kicks the can down the road. Such proofs always reason from some existing generalization, in this case, the generalization that balls are round, a generalization which itself must be proven. Now, you might object that we don't need to prove this, that roundness is just part of what it means to be a ball, but this misses the fact that concepts are objective. When we form a concept, its distinguishing characteristics are generalizations. When we conceptualize roundness as being a distinguishing characteristic of ball, we implicitly form the generalization, all balls are round. These generalizations must be proven because man can err when forming concepts. Although concepts for perceptual level existence like ball are rarely flawed, conceptualization of higher abstractions is not always so easy. The faulty mainstream concept of selfishness packages together one, concern for one's own interests, and two, a disregard of others. Such a concept leads to false generalizations. Generalizations like, people chiefly concerned with their own self-interest will steal money when they can get away with it. 
If a concept contradicts itself in the way selfishness does, then any generalizations made by connecting the nature of its units to its actions will not generally be true. Causal connections on their own do not prove generalizations because such connections rely on the validity of the concepts that they reason from. So if that's the case, then what validates concepts? Well, when a conceptual framework is flawed, it will prevent the grasp of certain facts. Those with the mainstream concepts of selfishness will struggle to grasp that stealing is self-destructive, not selfish, even when you can get away with it. In contrast, learning the objectivist concepts selfish and parasite brings this fact, and many others, into sharp focus. The purpose of concepts is to effectuate a grasp of the known facts. As a result, a conceptual framework is validated when it is shown to form a non-contradictory grasp of the full set of facts in one's context of knowledge. When a conceptual framework is shown to meet this standard, the generalizations implicit in their distinguishing characteristics are proven. Statements of the form all S is P are suddenly justified by the fact that P is just part of what it means to be an S. And when our conceptual framework forms a non-contradictory grasp of all of the facts, the distinguishing characteristics of those concepts form universally true statements, true generalizations. True generalizations, that is, in our context of knowledge, but that's all we ever have to do when we generalize. As a result, we can see that generalizations are proven by constructing a comprehensive conceptual framework. To achieve this, my theory provides detailed norms for crafting such a framework. When this is achieved, generalization by enumeration actually becomes possible, so long as the new generalization integrates with one's existing conceptual framework. The generalization, water is a conductor, is proven simply by observing instances where electric current flows through it. After observing enough instances, one validly concludes that conduction is a property of this kind of material. It's just part of what it means to be water. If I later come across some liquid that has all of the properties of water but does not conduct, I will form new concepts to differentiate these two liquids, but for now, Water simply means this kind of thing, with these properties, including conduction. Now, in just a moment, I'll explain how many is enough when you're talking about enough instances to generalize. We'll talk about that in a moment. As more is learned, concepts and their associated generalizations must be changed over time. Once water is reconceptualized to mean a very specific molecule, H2O, instead of simply referring to the clear liquid found in, found in lakes and streams, one can then grasp that it is the minerals commonly found in water, not H2O itself, which is conductive. My theory gives specific norms for changing concepts and generalizations as one's context of knowledge evolves. When a known factor could condition the subject matter of a generalization, such as known impurities in conductive samples of water, that factor and its effects on the generalization must be investigated before the generalization is considered proven. And my theory gives detailed norms for identifying such halts to generalization. Now, how many instances are enough to generalize, to conceptualize around? In order to answer that question, future editions of my theory will make use of Ron Pizzaturo's book, A Validation of Knowledge, in order to formulate a mathematically exact account of how the number of instances observed so far, for example, the number of samples of water so far found to be conductive, how that number improves the likelihood that similar instances will be observed in the future, that liquids with all the same properties as water, will also have the property of conduction. This helps determine how many instances scientists should observe in order to gain confidence that their generalizations are likely to hold into the future. Inference. 
the method of going beyond the senses. I have identified how to prove generalizations, which are integrations of known facts. But how do we validly apprehend facts to begin with? Well, there are essentially two ways. Direct observation and inference from direct observation. When a plastic rod is rubbed with a cloth, it will attract bits of paper. When scientists saw this, they concluded that the rod has a new property, charge. Now, how did they know this? The rubbing is directly perceived, but the rod's new property is not. This new property must be inferred. It must be deduced from observations and earlier principles. Specifically, this property is inferred from the principle that entities must act in accordance with their property. And if an entity acts differently from others, it must have properties that others lack. Going further, some scientists made the hypothesis that these bodies contain a new kind of entity by reasoning from the principle that an entity can gain new properties by gaining new constituent entities. Such inferences are the first steps towards discovering the electron. Now, in these examples, notice that these inferences make use of certain broad concepts like entity, action, and property. They also made use of principles such as the properties of entities are affected by their constituent entities. My theory gives a clear interconnected system of fundamental concepts and principles of this kind, which form the foundation of inferences in the sciences. These concepts and principles enable a validation of well-known methods of inference, such as Mill's methods. They also enable an explication of methods used implicitly in the history of physics. And they also allow for an identification of brand new methods of inference that may never have been used before. Certainty through top-down integration. To understand induction, one must understand the difference between logical inductive order, explained earlier, which proceeds bottom up, and the order of integration, like that of Euclid's elements or OPAR. Such an order proceeds top down. In great works of this kind, the broadest principles, such as Euclid's five postulates, are developed first. Then narrower principles, like the Pythagorean theorem, are explained by using these broader principles. These great works of integration do not constitute inductive proof in themselves, but are instead the crown of an inductive proof, a final step which facilitates certainty. In OPAR, the virtues are developed only after man's life as the moral standard is explained, since the nature of virtue is a result of the proper moral standard. When concepts and their associated generalizations are structured in this top-down way, it allows the scientist to efficiently see every concept and generalization in the light of all of the facts which condition it. This makes it much easier to form a conceptual framework which forms a non-contradictory grasp of the full set of facts in one's context of knowledge, which makes it much easier to give the final proof of one's generalizations. To achieve this, my theory therefore gives specific norms for integrating one's knowledge by constructing these top-down hierarchies. And that's the summary of my theory of induction. My ambition for this theory of induction is to enable certainty in the sciences. By following this procedure and meeting these standards, scientists can understand nature with more clarity and confidence than ever before. If discoveries achieved by a few geniuses have lifted mankind from the swamp to the stars in a mere 400 years, imagine what will be possible once the method of inductive certainty is just as common as literacy is today. To preview the current draft of my theory of induction, you can support my project at patreon.com inductica or contact us directly at inductica.org contact. Thanks for listening.